Among the topics that you and your colleagues have been studying have been misogyny, sexual harassment. Can you tell me why those, those topics in particular? Yes, we got in, interested in misogyny and sexual harassment um, a couple of years ago uh, and for a number of reasons. And this was sort of pre-Me Too. I mean, we've been, you know, we're, we're excited that this is all erupting into a national conversation now. Um, but my, I have a, a strong area of interest, which is um, romantic relationships, healthy romantic relationships, healthy sexual relationships. I don't think it's, it's something we talk about. I don't think we talk about um, how it is that you learn to love somebody um, ethically and with generosity and with tenderness, and um, that we need to prepare kids to do that. In the course of doing that work, one of the things that I kept bumping into was um, a high degree of misogyny and sexual harassment. And I came to feel in the course of doing that work that this is also, this is also something that's pervasive, you know, more pervasive than bullying, um, and we're really not talking about it. Um, we were especially not talking about it then. Um, but we're still not talking about it enough in middle school and high school, and teachers really don't have the tools to intervene effectively around this. Educators don't have the tools. Um, and, and we're not addressing it in sex education either. So the combination of those things was very concerning and we decided that this is an area we wanted to focus on. If you could tell me about the study. Well, in my conversations, in my interactions with, with teens, in my um, visits to schools, and my conversations with some parents, I was hearing a lot about harassment and misogyny. And so we decided to look at this more systematically. And we did a survey of about 3,000 students um, from across the country, um, diverse in terms of uh, race, class, region of the country. And it's a study of 18 to 25 year olds and we're asking them if they've ever experienced sexual harassment um, of different kinds, um, their views about sexual assault, some of their views about gender. So there's a range of questions we're asking them in the survey. We also did some individual interviews. We talked to people who um, teach sex ed courses or work with teens around some of these issues. Um, so we use a number of different methods to collect data about this. Tell me what some of the key findings were. Well, you know, the, the, the key finding, which, you know, I find very troubling, is that about 80% of women, 18 to 25-year-old women, young women, report having been sexually harassed in one form or another. And by sexual harassment, we mean being called a sexually degrading word like bitch or slut or hoe. We mean being catcalled, touched inappropriately. So if you aggregate those things, about 87% have experienced those things. You know, Peggy Ornstein in her book says about 100% of the women, she, the girls she had talked to had experienced these things. We've done focus groups with girls and talked to other people where it seems like the percent is closer to 100%. We also found that about 70%, 76%, a little over 75%, a little over three quarters of young women had never had their, of young people had never had a conversation with their parents about sexual harassment. What constitutes sexual harassment? What do you do if you're sexually harassed? How do you avoid being sexually harassed? Um, those kind of basic conversations are not going on in families, nor does it appear that those basic conversations are going on in schools most of the time. Why not? Um, I think it's a number of reasons. I think there's some attitude out there in the country still that this is boys will be boys and boys are going to do these things. Um, I think there's some, a lot of discomfort about having these conversations because they are about, um, about sex um, often and about sexual words and degrading sexual words, so there's discomfort. One of the things that I've found in my conversations with my own students who are often teachers with parents is um, a lot of discomfort because they don't have confidence that they can intervene effectively. This is particularly true, I think, among women who um, are talking to young boys who fear, I mean, they tell me this, they fear they will be written off, um, that boys will not take them seriously. I have talked to moms who feel this way about their sons, that they don't feel like they know how to intervene effectively. Um, fathers have somewhat more comfort with this, I think, but still, a lot of fathers, I think, are not intervening either around this stuff. Um, I also think these are hard problems to intervene with, and um, they're hard to be, it's hard to be effective, and that becomes a deterrent, too, that people feel like they're not effective.
Rick, when did you and your colleagues start studying this issue? Did you actually start looking at this problem prior to the We Me started Too? looking about four years ago, and um, we did the survey two years ago, um, uh, but have continued to have conversations with young people and um, have continued to develop resources for schools and for parents um, for addressing these problems. What are the implications from, from, uh, from this study, from these findings? Well, there are really three big findings in the report. I mean, one big finding is that, in a sense, the hookup culture is exaggerated, that we're very worried about the number of people, um, hook college students hooking up, but it's not a lot of students who are hooking up regularly. Um, in fact, students in general are having less sex now than they were 25 years ago. More students are graduating as virgins from high school now than was true 20 or 25 years ago. There is a, a subgroup of students, you know, maybe 10 to 15 percent who are hooking up a lot. But for about 85 percent of students, that's just not, you know, they're not hooking up um, frequently. Um, so that's one finding. So, you know, part of what we're saying is there's nothing wrong with you if you're not hooking up. Because I think a lot of people feel like they're defective because they're not hooking up because they have this image that everybody is hooking up. I and mean, this is the other thing we found is in the data, is that most students think that most other students are hooking up a lot, but in fact it's a small minority. Um, the other findings were around romantic love and a high percentage of kids who want to talk to other adults about you know, the demanding, subtle, generous uh, work you need to do to develop a caring relationship with somebody, how to handle breakups, how to start a relationship, but adults aren't talking to them. The third finding is about misogyny and harassment. It's about how pervasive it is and about the lack of conversation about it. Um, in terms of the third finding around misogyny and sexual harassment, what we're recommending is that we have to have the talk. <laughs> you know, it's, and it's not just to talk about sex, it's to talk about how we treat each other and how we care for each other, why it's harmful to use words like bitch, hoe, or slut. Um, for example, you know, those are, we have, to, we have to talk about why is it harm, why does it seem so hard for boys to have empathy for girls and what can we do about that and having conversations about that. Why are girls and women sexualized so much on TV? And we have to start a conversation about that as well. Um, so, you know, these are things that we, you know, part of the report is just like a wake up call, like it's time to have the conversation. Part of the report is also giving parents and schools specific strategies for how to talk about these things as well. How do you begin that conversation? What do parents need to do? Well, I think, you know, part of this is not, this is more reactive in a sense than proactive. So there are countless times um, during the year, there are a number of times during a week where, you know, parents are with their kids in the car and they hear a they're listening to the radio and they hear a song lyric that's degrading to women or is um, offensive in some way, that's an opportunity to have the conversation. You're sitting watching TV and you see um, a sexist stereotype or an act of misogyny in TV, that's an opportunity to have the conversation. You're at the dinner table or you know some of your kids' friends are over and you know one boy calls another boy a bitch or a hoe or a slut. Or, one boy refers to a girl at school as a bitch or host slut. That's, an that's a chance to have the conversation. So there are all these chances to have the conversation. Um, but I also think you need to have the, pro the conversation proactively. Like, is, is, this is, if you are a boy, you need to have a conversation with your mother and father, um, um, or you know, other people who are available to you about the expectations about how we treat people. First of all, a lot of kids don't know what sexual harassment is. They don't know what sexual assault is. They think sexual assault is only dragging a woman into a, an alley and raping them. They don't know that sexual, you can't have sex with somebody who is incapacitated by, by, by alcohol. You can't pressure somebody to have sex who doesn't want to have sex with you. Basic conversations like that. A lot of boys think girls are flattered by catcalling. You know, parents need to say to their boys, a lot of women, and this comes up in our data, are frightened by catcalling and offended by catcalling. So, you know, these are basic conversations that parents have to have with their kids. Um, you know, I think it's appropriate for parents to have conversations with their boys in which they say, you know, they're gonna be, you're going to be in a peer culture where there's going to be a, probably a lot of degrading, deg degrading of girls going on. 
And my hope is that when you can, you'll be an upstander. You know, you'll say, like, that's not cool. Like, that's not an okay thing to do. I just wanted to ask you some of the, the parent steps, the parental steps that they can take to either initiate the conversation or you be reactive if yeah. they have to be. Well, you know, I think there are all these opportunities to be reactive. So when you're in the car, you are listening to a radio, listening to a radio, listening to a song on the radio that's degrading to women, that's an opportunity. When you're watching TV, something happens that's misogynistic. That's a chance to have the conversation. Um, you know, one of your kid's friends um, calls another one of your kid's friends a bitch, a hoe, or a slut, or says that's so gay. That's, those, are con those are opportunities to have the conversation. So I think there's a steady stream of opportunities, and parents just have to be prepared to seize those moments and to know how to have that conversation. Then I think there's a proactive conversation, a conversation about how we treat people in this family. And, Conversation with boys about, you know, it's really not okay with me to use a word like bitch or hoe or slut. That we, I, you know, this is a word that's degrading. It's important to stand up for your friends, if you can, who do these things. Uh, um, and here's why I believe that's true. Um, and, you know, th these are not easy conversations to have. These are very tough conversations to have. But, you know, I think it's, it's you know, one thing to ask boys is, why do you think this would be okay, like to say something degrading um, about girls? And you know, boys will probably say they're being funny, they're being ironic, that, that as an adult you don't understand. And I think your response to that is, you know, this is, these are things that one shouldn't be joking about with your friends when you don't know how they view these things. And when it's such a slippery slope to real forms of harm, you know, to assault and um, to sexual violence and many other problems that are very serious. Um, so, you know, it can add to a culture that supports some things that in this family we really don't believe in and I know you don't believe in either. So these are very, you know, these are very important conversations um, to be able to have and to think through with your friends and to try different things to see where you're making, getting traction, where you're not getting traction. I don't think these conversations should be scolding in the sense that you don't want your kids to go underground. Um, I also think that you got to give your kids just basic information about what harassment is. That a lot of boys don't know that catcalling. Um, a lot of in our research, a lot of boys think catcalling is flattering to girls. A lot of girls say it's offensive and and um, it's offensive to them and it's frightening to them. Boys need to know that when they do these things, that girls are likely to be offended um, and and frightened by it. Um, a lot of kids don't know around sexual assault, that it's not okay to pressure someone to have sex, that it's not okay to have sex with somebody who's incapacitated by alcohol. I mean, basic information that we've got to provide our boys. Is there anything I didn't ask you, Rick, that you would want to make sure people know? I think that, you know, I mean, two things that, that I wanted to add. One is that sexual harassment goes both ways. That, you know, I'm, I'm more concerned and our data suggests that it's, you know, significantly more common for boys to harass girls, but girls can also harass boys, um, that is going on. There's also, um, this is not what our report is about, um, but it's what our, some of our, I hope our future work will be about. There's sub substantial harassment of LGBTQIA students in schools too, and particularly uses of things like the phrase, that's so gay. And similarly, I don't think parents have tools for understanding how to respond to that phrase, and I don't think schools, educators often have responses um, effective responses when they hear homophobic language or language that's degrading to LGBTQIA students.